When I was 13, my mom gave me a book for Christmas called The Illustrated Atlas of the Universe. And for the next two days, I couldn't put it down. I wanted to learn all that I could about astronomy, from new discoveries about stars to the mysteries of cosmology. But how are those discoveries made? What does the process look like to go from scientific hypothesis to academic paper? And do scientists ever encounter any surprises along the way? My name is Anna O'Grady, and I study stars. Stars are the fundamental building block of our universe. They are the hosts to planets like our own Earth, they collect to form galaxies like our Milky Way, and when stars die, they enrich the universe with their elements, and those elements will later go on to form new planets, new stars, and new life. Even though stellar evolution is one of the most well-studied branches of astronomy, as with anything in science, there's still a lot we don't know. One of the biggest questions that we still have is which stars explode as supernova? To fully understand stars, we not only need to understand common stars, like our own sun, but the rare classes of stars as well. So one way that astronomers do this is by sorting stars by their luminosity, or how bright they are, and their temperature, or how hot they are. And when you do this, this gives us a diagram that we call a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or a HR diagram for short. Some stars are brighter than our sun. These are typically hotter stars as well. Other stars are dimmer than our sun, and they're cooler than our sun. If you organize all of these stars together, you will get this solid line running from the bottom right to the top left of the HR diagram. This is something that astronomers call the main sequence. When stars eventually burn through the hydrogen fuel in their cores, they begin burning helium and move into a higher luminosity area of the HR diagram. They are now evolved stars. And this is one of two broad ways of classifying stars. Stars on the main sequence and evolved stars that branch off of the main sequence. Among evolved stars, there are two main branches, giant stars and supergiant stars. The mass of a star is critical in determining which of these two branches a star evolves into. When a low-mass star, like our own sun, begins to burn helium, they evolve into giant stars. After this, they will eventually run out of helium fuel and begin to puff off their outer layers. This will leave behind their core as a white dwarf star and a beautiful planetary nebula that is filled with the elements that were created inside of this giant star. These elements then go on to enrich the universe, creating new stars and new planets. Stars much more massive than our sun are classified as high mass stars. These stars, once they run out of hydrogen, will swell up into supergiants. These supergiants exist in a different part of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. They are much more luminous than giant stars. As supergiants evolve, they will eventually explode as violent supernova. These supernova scatter element-rich gas, which are then the building blocks for more stars and more planets. So low-mass stars and high-mass stars both return elements to the universe, but they return different elements, and they do it in very different ways. While we can populate this Hertzsprung-Russell diagram with lots of different types of stars, there are still gaps in our knowledge. For example, how massive does a star need to be in order to evolve into a supergiant and explode instead of evolving into a giant? Or to put it another way, at what mass is the tipping point between low and high mass stellar evolution? 
Another example is how small can a star be and still achieve nuclear fusion? Or how far down does this end of the main sequence go? My research is focused on a unique class of stars known as thorn Zhikov objects, or TZOs. TZOs are a really unique class of stars. They are quite literally stars within stars. On the outside, they look like normal red supergiants, so massive stars, but they don't have normal cores. Instead, they contain neutron stars as cores. And this neutron star is the leftover remnant from a companion star that exploded as a supernova. TZOs were originally theorized in the 1970s, and astronomers have always wondered whether or not these stars could really exist, and if they did, how to even identify them. So when I started research on this project, I honestly felt a little bit intimidated because there are many uncertainties and unknowns with this particular class of star. When I began my project, there was one really strong candidate for a thorn Zhikov object. It's a star called HV2112, located in the Small Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite galaxy of our own Milky Way. And HV2112 was a very bright and very red star that was variable. So what that means is that its brightness changes over time. So I wanted to find more stars that looked like HV2112, since it was a TZO candidate. But that in and of itself is really challenging. So this is my office space, and this is my desk in particular. So this is where I've spent the last uh, five years as a PhD student, and specifically the time working on this paper. So this is the light curve of HV2112, so these data are from Assassin. So this is showing how the star changes in brightness over the course of several hundred days. You can see this interesting feature where it looks like the light curve is at its peak, but then it goes up again. This is the double peaked phenomena. So I really specifically wanted to find other stars that were doing exactly this. So the very first step was to first get all of the stars in both of the Magellanic Clouds. So I did this um, using a uh, catalog service that keeps all astronomical data sets sort of together in the one place. Um, so there's a whole lot of data here. As I mentioned, this initial sample of stars is about a million. Uh, in the red is all of these stars in the large Magellanic Cloud, and then the pink ones are the ones that I did the data quality and brightness cuts on. I then uh, wrote code in order to get the periods, the amplitudes, the properties of that variability so that I could sort through them and find the ones that had properties that were very similar to HV2112. And then I manually went through all of these stars and looked at their uh, light curve data, the actual visual representation, to try and find the ones that specifically also had this little double peak. Uh, and then if I just go through some of the examples here, um, yeah, we were successful. All in all, we found nine other stars, so counting HG2112, 10 in total, that shared these common properties and that we wanted to uh, sort of dig into a little bit more. We want to understand the physical properties of this group of stars, but how exactly do we do that? If I want to know the temperature of these stars, I can't exactly go out and stick a thermometer in it. That's one of the main challenges of astronomy. However, with our knowledge of physics and our observations of stars, we can transform observed properties, like the brightness and color of a star, to intrinsic physical properties, like the luminosity and temperature. So we have our observed properties for our stars, our brightnesses and colors, but we want to translate those to physical properties of luminosity and temperature. And we do that using theoretical models and our MCMC -MC process. So we begin with the brightness and color of one of our stars. So this is our real data that we're trying to get physical properties that correspond to it. 
We then ask our model to create a star with some luminosity and temperature, and then ask what would the observed properties of that star be, so the brightness and the color. The MCMC then asks, how good is the fit between these two points? It's not very good, so we'll try something else. And the MCMC will then do a random walk around this parameter space, trying thousands or tens of thousands of different variations of temperature and luminosity. That will then eventually lead to some points having a really good fit, being right on top of our real data. That corresponds, of course, to a particular luminosity and temperature. So for our star, this thing gives us our result, a physical luminosity and temperature that we can put on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So from this, we end up with luminosity and temperature for our little group of stars, which will allow us to put them right back on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And this is the part where things got interesting. When we put our stars on the HR diagram, they didn't land where Thorne-Jakob objects are thought to exist, which is right around here, a little bit colder than most supergiants. Instead, their masses were not big enough to be supergiants. They were instead giant stars and landed right about here. But this area of the hertz russell diagram is still very interesting. If you remember at the beginning, when I talked about gaps in our knowledge on the hertz russell diagram, and in particular, the tipping point between low and high mass stellar evolution and what mass that takes place at, this gap in our knowledge continues from the main sequence up into the evolved part of the HR diagram and passes right along where our stars are. So these stars are a particular class known as super AGB stars. So these are evolved giant stars and an extremely rare class. A group of this population had not been observed before. This was when I realized that the title of the paper was going to have to change. Because at this point, I was calling it um, a systematic identification of thorn Jacob object candidates. And then I see this plot, and I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> we can't say that anymore. This is not what we were expecting. Not what I set out to do for this project, but science surprises you in those ways, and it's a good thing that that happens. Super AGBs are in the last of their evolutionary phases. They're thought to be between about seven and 11 times the mass of our sun. Most super AGBs won't explode as supernova, they're giant stars, but the very, very most massive super AGBs will. And therefore, these would be the lowest mass of star that do explode as supernovae. So why is that important? Well, within our universe, there are many more low-mass stars than high-mass stars. There's significantly more stars that are as big as our sun compared to stars that are 20 times the mass of our sun. So because of this, the exact mass at which stars start exploding dramatically changes the amount of supernova that we think will explode. And knowing that, it's just one more piece of this giant cosmic puzzle. I mean, you can really think of stars as like Lego bricks. Um, everything in the universe basically just comes down to stars. Like stars are what planets go around, stars are what make up a galaxy. Um, you have to understand stars if you want to just know how the universe works, like how galaxies evolve, uh, how gas is produced, how gas is destroyed, where planets come from. You know, whatever question astronomy you're interested in, it all comes back to stars and the way you'd like things to work is that some clever person says, I bet you this type of star is out there. And you go and you look and you go, yep, you were right. But it never works out like that. We were looking for one type of star and we found something completely unexpected. So this project definitely went in a different direction than I was initially anticipating, but that was actually really important to me uh, because results that we don't expect are uh, just a part of science. Incorrect hypotheses are just as important as the correct ones. Scientists follow where the data leads us, not where we maybe want it to go. This is why sometimes scientists might change their minds. It's because new data or a new theory has led us in a new direction. 
it is absolutely essential for science that this is the process, that we allow new data or unexpected things to guide our path to the knowledge that we're seeking. So the fact that this happened on my very first project was, if surprising, actually a really good thing. Can you tell me about this? Yeah. That's me, and then this humongous contraption here, this is one of the two Magellan telescopes. So I love this picture because it really gives you a sense of scale of the telescope. Uh, yeah, and I was very surprised to see that this is on the front page of the telegram. Not only front page, but it, it pushed COVID over, <laughs> which, was, which is a nice thing to see. Uh, but yeah, definitely super surprising. <laughs> Uh, I think my mom has a copy of it framed. Um, I, I haven't gotten my copy of it framed yet, but 